it's, it's been a great honor and a pleasure to be here. I enjoyed all the, the two plenaries and the presentations I attended so far uh, in this wonderful location. So um, today I'll talk to you about a topic that has been close to my heart for the last couple of years. Um, it's a talk, I do want to cl uh, make a clarification, I, it's a talk that is closely related to one I gave exactly 13 months ago at CDC in Japan. Uh, 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 Professor Vidya Sagar invited me here and asked me to please uh, deliver it today as well. So I will talk about um, um, uh, a beautiful discipline of network systems, try to give it a, a tutorial and educational overview, show you some nice examples, some of the main results, and then I'll talk about two applications of, of this general theory, one in the area of, uh, of science and engineering in power networks, and one in the area of, uh, of uh, the social sciences in the context of something called influence systems. So let's see if I can get through my ambitious program. Um, as you know, there is an increasing uh, amount of attention in research and technology being developed to large-scale systems, whether they are in the context of smart grids, whether they arise in robotics, in the context of, and, and they're related to our infrastructures. For example, on the bottom left, probably invisible to you, is a water network in the city of Portland. And, and there are large-scale structures uh, uh, that permeate our modern society. Similarly, network systems are prevalent and widely studied also in the sciences at, at large, in, 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 for example, in social sciences, such as in sociology. People are very interested in understanding influence systems, evolution of opinions, decision making, and performance of teams. And then also in, in, in topics such as ecology, here's a food web, economics, there is a award, Nobel Award winning text describing input output systems and, and the network relationships that describe the functioning of our economy. Um, and in biology, on the, on the right, there is an example of nuclear medicine where in a compartmental system one is able to perform accurate measurements about, uh, by, by, you know, th through, through the injection of isotopes and x-rays. Now, before I continue, let me say, let me, I've had a pleasure over the years to work with a talented group of, of students, many of whom, uh, in fact, from, uh, who graduated from one of the IITs. Today's work is, is the joint work with Florian and John on the power network side and with Noah and Pong on the social, social uh, network side. So this is the outline. I'll spend most of my time on number one, and then I'll give you a little bit of a flavor for topic two and three. Um, so... At its heart, I'm going to start with a very simple linear or affine formulation, and the complexity is really not in the A and B, but it's in the concept that these objects have very large dimensions, and in the desire that we have to explain the functioning of these systems as a function of the structure of those matrices and those graphs. So in, in what follows, I'll be trying to relate the structure of the network with the function of the system. And for this first half of the talk, when I take, talk about function, I mean mostly I mean asymptotic behavior. But when I'll talk about power networks, I'll mean power transmission and, and so on and so forth. So the function of the network may differ in the different applications. Now, at the heart of this theory, there is a beautiful set of results that originated about a hundred years ago with the work of Perron followed up by the work by Frobenius. So there's really a beautiful and ultimately very powerful sets of tools that originate in this theory. So here's a sketch of it. So it goes like this. You start to work with matrices that are non-negative. So this is a Venn diagram. Inside the set of non-negative matrices are matrices called irreducible, for which if you compute the sum of the power of the matrix, you get a strictly positive matrix. And inside the set of reducible lie the set of primitive matrices. Those are matrices for which at some moment in time, when you keep raising them to a some power k, you get a strictly positive matrix. All right, so now these matrices have nice properties. So we have an ability to characterize their spectral structure, in particular their dominant eigenvalue, and much information about their eigenvector. Specifically, for a non-negative matrix, it is known that there is an eigenvalue that is greater than or equal to in magnitude to the others. That eigenvalue is real and positive, or zero. And this eigenvalue comes with a non-negative uh, uh, left and right eigenvector. I will denote them with the symbol V right and V left, and they will be relevant later on. If you are able to look, if the, your system provides you with an irreducibility property, then the peron frobenius theory strengthens the results by saying that the, the dominant eigenvalue is now strictly positive, so you are sure now that it is strictly positive and simple, and the eigenvectors themselves are also strictly positive and, and unique modular rescaling. Finally, 
in the, in the best and strongest of all cases, if you are dealing with a matrix that is primitive, then the eigenvalue is strictly dominant, meaning to say there is a strict inequality sign here. And what that immediately tells you, I hope you can all see, is that you can immediately infer properties about the asymptotic performance of the discrete time system defined by A. And that, that's the fact that the limit will become a rank one matrix described by the product of the two right and left eigenvectors, right? Normalized in a certain way. So this is a quite comprehensive understanding and there's a much richer theory behind here with many more details that I am able to describe today. Now, one of the beautiful parts of this theory is that it has an equivalent or it has a lot of connections, powerful connections, if and only if conditions, with algebraic graph theory. So in the study of graphs, um, you, uh, um, you have certain properties that you can now nicely relate to the properties of the matrices themselves. So one of the key ideas that's very simple is that a very little calculation allows you to understand that the powers of the matrix A are closely related to the, to the paths and to the number of paths and the weights of the paths in the graph G, the graph associated to the matrix. So specifically, if you take the matrix A, raise it to the power of K and look at the IJ entry, that entry is strictly positive if and only if there exists a directed path in the graph from I to J of length K. So that's a very nice result at the heart of many, many following results later on. It's very simple. The proof is just a couple of lines. You really write down the formula for the product of matrices and you understand the meaning of each term. Now, for example, this is a derivative result which tells you how to characterize when is a matrix primitive. And that result, remember, primitive means that you start with non-negative, but at some point in time after you take powers, it's going to become strictly positive. And that's an if and only if, if the graph that you are given is strongly connected, so there's a path from every node to every other node, and it's aperiodic. Aperiodic means there exists no positive integer that divides, well, greater than one, that divides the length of each cycle in the graph. So there are no, no periods. Now, another tool that is useful in the, from algebraic graph theory, I hope, and I think it is cut off there a little bit, is, is that of condensation. So what's the condensation? It goes like this. The, um, Hopefully now you can see it and it's not cut off. Um, so if you start with an arbitrary directed graph, you, you aggregate each of, the, each of its strongly connected components. So a strongly connected component is a subgraph that is strongly connected and you cannot be enlarged while retaining the strong connectivity property. And then now you construct a, 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 you know, and then the, the graph of strongly connected component is called the condensation or the condensed graph. And it has, you know, it's, it's here, I've, I depicted here in colors. It's an acyclic directed graph, so there are no cycles because the cycle is strongly connected. And it has at least one sink and one source, just as every directed acyclic graph has. So that's a nice insight into the structure of these graphs that I will, sh I will use in a couple of slides. So these are some basic elements of this theory. So now let me start to talk about some interesting dynamics that, that, is, that, is, that you can uh, characterize using this theory and that it actually pervades many different uh, disciplines. So here is an example. So this is an averaging system and it uh, originates, for example, in the, in the study of swarming. So here you have a swarm of fish and the fish in the middle here decides to compare its heading and set its new heading to be equal to an average of the value of the headings of its neighbors. So that's, for example, the dynamics. In discrete time, I set xi at the next time to be the average of those values. Now, immediately, you can rewrite this as a linear time invariant system with the matrix A that is non-negative because the averaging coefficients are non-negative themselves. So that matrix is, is I'll refer to as an influence matrix. And what follows, it's a row stochastic, meaning to say it's not only non-negative, but also it's row sums equal to 1. And there are results uh, that, that one, you know, using the tools I just described, one can get immediately on the behavior of this averaging system as time diverges. And so specifically, if you have a general directed graph with multiple condensations, condensed sinks, so remember, in, in the condensation, it's a direct, it's a, a cyclic graph, but there is at least one sink. In the picture I had before, there was more than one. In each sink, you will reach consensus. And in the nodes that are not at sink, you will reach a convex combinations of the nodes that are at the sinks. Let me clarify what I mean by consensus. By consensus, I mean to say that the value of the state will reach the vector, a scalar multiple of the vector of ones, the scalar multiple being given by a dot product I'll discuss in a second. So, so here, um, 
in this group of in this group of fishes, if they're strongly connected, they will reach consensus. If you're com if they're composed of multiple condensed sinks, not a single strongly connected component, then in general you will reach consensus heading for each subgroup and fish that look at both subgroups will reach a convex combination of the two consensus values. Now, what are the consensus values equal to? That's an interesting value, an interesting uh, uh, calculation that I'll use later. It goes like this. It's actually determined by the initial conditions x at time zero, but then multiply by the left dominant eigenvector. So the left dominant eigenvector, I will normalize it now it's not negative. I'll normalize it to have entries that sum to one. So I'll think of it as percentages. And so the final value will depend upon, will be a percentage combination, right? A convex combination of the, of the initial values. Some fish may have a larger influence than other fish. Some individuals in the group may have a disproportionately larger influence. So it makes sense to think of this, uh, of this vector as being uh, as giving you a score, a measure of centrality. So I'll refer to it as influence centrality. Right? Okay. So, a next example of a network system that I'd like to describe for you is another linear system. It's called a compartmental flow system. So, here, if you can see this picture, this is illustrating a very famous water flow model for a desert ecosystem. Water enters the desert through precipitation, it's accumulated in the soil, or in the plants, or in the animals through uptake and drinking, respectively. It then evaporates or it transpires or it evaporates from animals or animals also eat plants and that through a herb herbivory. And so that's the way in which you keep track of where water is and how does it flow through the ecosystem. And so, of course, this is a, a, a system with the conservation of mass, which is water. So it's very easy to write constitutive equations at each <coughs> node. That's simply qi dot, that's the amount of water at location at compartment i, and it's the sum of the inflows, j2i, minus the outflows, i2j. There is also an outflow from the compartment to the environment at large, right? When the water evaporates, it leaves the system, it goes back into the environment. And from the environment, there is a certain input ui, that's the amount of water that comes through precipitation, right? So now, if you make, so, well, this system in general could be nonlinear. In fact, I'll show. Uh, virus propagation models later in which that is nonlinear, but um, one class of interesting system arises when you assume that the flow depends linearly on the amount of, uh, of quantity of water in the donor in the original uh, compartment. So here you set the flow from i to j to be a coefficient times qi. And now you take all of the f, i, j, all of the rates coefficient and you put them up in a matrix. That's an adjacency matrix for the graph that you see here in this picture. I'm going to call that capital F. That's the matrix of flow rates. And then you write the, this is continuous time, uh, a fine linear system. Q is the state. This matrix here describes how to go from the matrix of flow to the matrix C, which I refer to as a compartmental matrix. So a compartmental matrix will come out of this little calculation here from the date from the, uh, the flow rates, and u continues to be the input. So compartmental matrices are not row stochastic because they have some entries on the diagonal that, that are negative, or certainly they don't need to be not positive. So they're, they're called quasi-positive or Metzler matrices with off-diagonal entries being non-negative. Uh, there is a uh, uh, beautiful theory for this, which, uh, which I will not describe today, but I'll, I'll just refer to you and mention that uh, there is a Perron Frobenius theory for, for quasi uh, positive matrices. There is also very important sets of properties that are relevant in this type of system that have to do with when is the inverse of a certain matrix positive. And they also have their own version of algebraic graph theory, just like what I discussed for stochastic matrices five minutes ago. Um, now, these compartmental systems are very easy to analyze based on with all of these tools. And immediately, for example, you get that um, the matrix C is Hurwitz, so all of the eigenvalues are on the left half plane, strict left half plane, so it's stable, uh, if and only if the system, the graph that, that I'm describing here, is outflow connected. Outflow connected means that from each compartment of the system, there is a directed path that leads back out onto the environment. So if you're outflow connected, that's if and only if with you being Horvitz, exponentially stable. And in fact, that immediately implies if any one of these two, and therefore both of these properties hold, then in fact the limit of Q is clearly equal to the unique equilibrium of this particular linear system, right? C, so you set the left-hand side to zero, you get that Q, the equilibrium value is minus C inverse U. 
Now, what you don't get, unless you use the theory of inverse positivity, you get confirmation that that value is non-negative, because of course you cannot have negative water or negative mass uh, at, at each location. Moreover, you even get a specific result that says that at compartment I, the final mass is strictly positive if and only if it is inflow connected, which means that there is a directed path from the precipitation, from the inputs, to that particular compartment, right? So, these are not surprising results, but my point is that the beautiful theory leads you very quickly to deriving them in a straightforward way, rather methodically. Now, um, clearly most interesting research problems arise in the nonlinear field. Now, in the nonlinear field, it's, it's actually, you're dealing with very rich behaviors. In other words, for example, if you look at population dynamics, you may, there may be limit cycles, there may be extinction of species. Um, if you're looking at spreading processes, I will show you an example where uh, a virus propagate, the vi a virus dissipates and is very quickly neglected in a population and it dies out. Or if the parameters of the virus propagation uh, surpass a certain threshold, there's a bifurcation and after that there's an epidemic uh, outbreak. So there's interesting behavior and then in the case of coupled oscillators, I'll, I'll briefly talk about the possibility of synchrony or asynchrony. So all of a sudden when you are looking at a nonlinear network system, there's a rich variety of behaviors that can arise. But the linear system theory is still relevant and you will see how you can use it in just a second. So let me show you just a couple of examples of nonlinear network systems and to show you some of this richness. So if you look at the way in which animals interact, um, for example, here I have a picture of clownfish and anemones. They, in some cases, they help each other. So this is a relationship of mutualism between the fish and the plant. And now, um, how do we model this? So there's a classic model in, in uh, population dynamics called the lotka volterra model. Many of us have seen the two-dimensional lotka volterra model that gives rise to a limit cycle. That's a predator-prey example. Here, I'm showing a different example. So suppose, once again, that xi is the quantity or density of species i. Now, how does the um, you know, each, each, uh, how does the rate of growth, that's, the, that's not the absolute rate, but the, re the relative rate of growth of species i, how does that uh, uh, depend? What does it depend upon? You see, if you neglect the second term, imagine it's only a function of bi, then you get that your species is either exponentially exploding to infinity or dying off. So that's not a very realistic model, clearly. Even if bi, if, even if the species start, at some point in time there will be bounded resources. So you really should assume that your that your evolution is growing, but then should tail off, right? So that's a logistic equation. What that means is that in order to get the logistic equation, you want to have bounded resources, so bi could easily be negative, and aii would be positive. Now, more generally, this is a, this is a term that describes the interaction between the species. So aij describes whether i benefits or is uh, or does not benefit or has a negative impact from the presence of species j. So in fact, if you look at the pair of entries aij, aji, they can both be positive, in which case both species help each other. They can be of opposite sign, that's a predation type of relationship where one species benefits and the other uh, has a negative impact from the presence of the first species. Or it could be one of competition in which both of them maybe feed on the same resource and therefore have a negative impact from the presence of the other species. Now, as I said, there are rich behaviors that occur in here. In the example that you may be familiar with, there's a periodic behavior. Here, let me talk about the case in which there's mutualism. Now here, you have logistic growth if uh, the coefficient bi is positive, so when when the species starts at zero, it, it, when there's very limited amounts of species, the species tend to grow. But then AII is negative, which means that when the species is large, then the bounded resources will give a negative impact. Moreover, let me once again repeat, that it makes sense to assume bounded resources, which means that it makes sense to assume that A is Horvitz, and I can relate that to the property of the matrix A. And then I will assume mutualism. I will assume that AIJ is non-negative. So now what one gets very quickly, once again, is that the natural behavior that you can expect does in fact take place, which is to say that there exists a unique steady state. It is strictly positive, and all trajectories converge to it. So that's a case in which uh, uh, you can com 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 conduct a complete analysis. Here's another example. It comes from epidemiology, where I have a nonlinear network system. Here I start from the case in which uh, uh, so here in the illustration, I have a network, I have nodes. These, in, these are individuals that are in contact with each other. Some individuals 
are more infected than others, or actually, let me take a step back. This could be individuals, and the red level in those nodes could be the percentage or the, the likelihood of that individual being infected, or each of those nodes could be a city, and the amount of red I draw in that graph would represent a percentage of population in that city that is infected. Both interpretations are relevant and, uh, and make sense under some assumptions in this setup. So the bottom line is that I have a value xi from 0 to 1 associated with each location. And here it's xi is very large, perhaps it is 1. And then the infection is propagating from this node, for example, to that one, right? Now, this is an SIS model, meaning to say that nodes can either be susceptible or infected, or they have a fraction of susceptible and a fraction of infected at each location. There is a rate with which the infection occurs and a rate with which you recover back to the susceptible state. Now, the likelihood of getting infected is proportional to a meeting between an infected and a non-infected person. When you think about that and you do some thinking about the stochastic analysis behind this all, you get a nonlinear dynamics. Here in red, the red part here says that the amount by which Xi will get more infective is, of course, modulated by the infection rate. And then it's also modulated by the frequency with which I interacts with J, right? That's a, the matrix Aij will describe the likelihood of individuals meeting, interacting. But then it's a quadratic term here, 1 minus Xi times Xj. Now, the rate of recovery here, I'll assume it to be just linear. And once again, here is a simple, nice equation in vector form for the network. So here, let me just analyze the case of irreducible contact matrices. There's some, <coughs> there's some nice recent work by uh, uh, Ali Kanafer on the case of reducible matrices. Now, in that case, going back to the peron frobenius theory, you know you have a dominant pair with left. Uh, with, in this case, I need a right eigenvector. Earlier, I used the left one, and the dominant eigenvalue lambda. And now it is known, it is known there are some nice papers in the 1970s that were completely forgotten and then rediscovered in the late 2000s by, by some engineers. It's, it's, it's well known that there are two behaviors. If you are below the threshold, meaning to say if lambda is below 1, um, then 0 is the unique stable equilibrium. And moreover, this convex combination of the infected population goes to zero exponentially fast and monotonically so. So what is lambda? Lambda, after I do all of the rescaling, the eigenvalue of A here as the interpretation of the reproduction number. In other words, if you're an infected individual, while you're infected, on average, how many individuals will you infect? If that number is below one, then in fact the epidemic will, will disappear exponentially monotonically fast. Instead, if lambda is greater than 1, so here there's a bifurcation going from lambda below 1 to lambda above 1, then 0 becomes unstable, a new equilibrium x star is, uh, is born, uh, strictly positive at each location because the matrix is irreducible, and in fact it is, so, it is easy to, sh well not easy, but with some work using Lyapunov functions, you can prove that all trajectory will convert to the endemic state. This is called endemic, meaning to say it does not, the epidemic, does, the infection does not disappear. Now, uh, I shown to you the two examples. I didn't talk to you about what tools I used to, to, to uh, study them. Now, I did use algebraic graph theory and peron frobenius theory, but of course, then these are nonlinear systems. You do need to use nonlinear systems theory. And so now, you use the standard nonlinear st stability theory. There's lots of beautiful results on passivity. Professor Arkach has wonderful results precisely on this domain, the case of passivity for network in interconnected systems. There's also beautiful theory of cooperative competitive systems and their generalization to monotone systems. So, but um, it's fair to say that we are, there aren't a lot of special purpose tools just for network systems, and I think there's still work that can be done in this domain. Now, just for, just for fun, let me briefly mention the results that I've shown to you. How did I obtain them? How are they obtained in the literature? There are, in fact, uh, uh, alternative equivalent proofs, but for example, in the case of the mutualistic Lotka-Volterra model, you can use cooperative systems theory. In cooperative systems theory, it's known that if the Jacobian of your nonlinear map is quasi-positive, then almost all bounded trajectory will converge to an equilibrium. And you can show that's a unique equilibrium, and so on and so forth for that particular system. Now, in the case of the network SIS model, uh, um, you, you do set up, certain, uh, you set up a certain map, you set up iterations, and you use the LaSalle invariance principle to, uh, to establish convergence ultimately. 
Now, um, these slides are available on my website right now. I have added some references in here to describe some of the beautiful, rich literature. In fact, one of the earliest references I found on averaging, despite the work of the control community in the, in the year 2000, originates all the way back to the work of sociologists in the 1950s. I think there's been a lot of work then also in, in, uh, in the area of uh, uh, distributed algorithms and computation. I think Professor Borkar mentioned this morning the, the work by Tsitsiklis. That's precisely related to what was discussed earlier this morning. I think in the context of compartmental system, that's a separate stream of research that is also, that is also old and rich. There is a very nice book by Walter and Contreras on compartmental modeling. Now, in the context of Zotka Volterra, there's beautiful work by Go that appear. There's a couple of beautiful uh, books and papers by him. There's a Japanese scientist by the name of Takeuchi who also collected a nice set of results on Lyapunov functions in this domain. And this is all related to the topic of evolutionary game theory. That's also beautiful sets of, sets of results. And now in the case of network SIS, the, the, the two references that I was mentioning earlier have been forgotten are work by Leimanovich and York in 76 and by Hathcote in 78, which already set up some of the nice model and, and some of the results. Again, they were, they were completely forgotten for, for a, good, a good amount of time. Now, um, this is now a plug for my free book that you can download off of my website. So this set of theories and tools and, and examples and motivating applications, I've tried to put in a book that, that I'm, I'm still working on uh, and you can find on my website. If you are an instructor, I have slides and I have answer keys that I am uh, more than delighted to share with you. Okay, so can I ask you how much time do I have? Now, um, this was my first part, a general introduction. Now I would like to show two areas that are two application areas where I'll show you some, some more uh, design-oriented and analysis-oriented results. 25 minutes. 25 minutes, perfect. I think I am, I am on time. Um, and if I run out of time, as I typically do, please don't hesitate to stop me after the talk and ask me many more questions later on. I'll be happy to show you more details. Now, the first example is an engineering man-made system. The second one has to do with social influence system. That's, that's from social sciences. Now, so I'll talk about power flow equations. That's a very basic tool and concept in, in the study of alternating current uh, circuits and power networks. Um, I will not talk so much about design, but let me just clearly mention to you that these are at the heart of many uh, analysis, monitoring, and design problems, right? Um, they are the heart of understanding whether the power network possesses an operating condition, a secure operating condition, away from failure. Powerful equations are at the heart of many feedback control schemes and, and many economic optimization problems. In fact, you find them pretty much everywhere, right? Um, they have to do power flow equations. What do they do? They relate the voltage and magnitude, sorry, the voltage, magnitude, and phase with the active and reactive power injection and with the network topology, right? At each node, you have injection of active and reactive power. At each node, the voltage, it's a phasor. It's described by a magnitude and a phase. And these variables are all related by some parameters which are given to you by the admittance matrix of the network. And what do I want to do? Well, uh, I know there are accurate numerical solvers that are currently in use, but I would like to take one more look at power flow equations uh, and try to relate the network structure to the network function. So the network structure here really is just an admittance matrix describing the alternating current circuit. And the function here is power. much power. I let you do it. Can you all hear me? Or do I need to speak into that now? Uh, if I'm here, can you hear me? The one in the back, can you hear me or do you want me to use the microphone? Okay, look like everybody is okay. All right, perfect. So, um, okay, so here's a 30 second uh, summary. So. I'm going to assume I'm in quasi-synchronous evolution, so everything is running at 50 hertz or 60 hertz, so I have a magnitude and a phase for each variable. Now, power, uh, so then my network consists of red nodes, which are the loads, and blue nodes, which are the generators. 
which means the generator means the active and reactive power are going to be positive at the generator, so active power is positive, and then if you're a load, active power is negative. Now, uh, the, the, um, let me clarify, so everything is oscillating, right? It's oscillatory, oscillatory signals. So even instantaneous power is oscillatory. If you take the average of the oscillatory power, instantaneous power, that's called real power, active power, and then the deviation from the average is called reactive power. Now, if you are if you are a user, some of your devices may need reactive power, and if you are a, a utility, you don't want to provide reactive power because it actually provides no money to you. But in any case, the point is that there's both active and reactive power that describe the, the, the total amount of power transmitted by the network. Both of them need to be balanced. Now, I'm going to assume lossless lines, and I will I will actually look at the uh, the coupled equation, the, uh, the coupled power flow equation. So, uh, in a first approximation, there are there are, well, first of all, let's step back. So at each node, there are four variables. Because at each node, you have the, mo the magnitude and the phase of the voltage. And then you have an injection of active and reactive power. So there are four equations at each node. These four equations are, uh, sorry, four variables at each node. How do you determine the four variables? Well, two of them are going to be like, if you, are a, if you are a generator, typically as a generator, you provide a certain amount of active power and you set the voltage at certain, at certain high level. So two of the variables are set at the generator location. The other two are variable and are determined by the network. The other two being the angle and the uh, reactive power provided. At the load, instead, you have a certain amount of reactive power that you need and a certain amount of active power. So in other words, at each location, there are four variables. Two of them are determined by the nature of the node. The other two are determined by the power flow equations. There are two power flow equations at each node. And in this slide, they're written as decoupled. There is an active power flow equation and a reactive power flow equation. In the first approximation, the active power flow is uniquely related to the difference in the phase angles. And the reactive power flow equation depends uniquely upon the voltages, right? This is an approximation, but it's good enough for today. Now, um, the first equation says, for example, that the total amount of power injected at node I is equal to the sum So this is a curve curve conservation law, the total amount of power that goes from I to J. How much power goes from I to J? Well, that's the, total, that's the maximum amount, AIJ, times the sine of the angle, the sine of the phase angle between I and J, theta I minus theta J. So in other words, if the two nodes, generator and load, are at the same angle, <coughs> theta I equal to theta J, you transmit no active power. As the two angles become out of phase, then you transmit real positive power, right? When that angle reaches 90 degrees, that's the maximum amount of power. If the angle becomes larger, if you want to transmit more power than that, there's no solution, right? There's no solution, because you just cannot carry more power than that from the net. Now, in the, uh, let me go, uh, I'll give you a similar interpretation for the reactive flow uh, in, in a second. Let me talk some more about the, 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 the problem, that, what is it that I want to do? So, these are the two equations. And I want to understand as a function of the network parameters, the network parameters are essentially just the AIJ here and the VIJ there. I want to understand whether those solutions, admit, those equations admit a solution, which is going to be called an operating condition for the power network. And then uh, I want to understand, you know, whether that's stable, how far am I from stability margins for the, from, the, from the point where that solution disappears. I also want to understand how much power can I transmit? Can I transmit, when, what's the maximum amount of power in some sense that I can transmit? Now, before I continue, let me show you, let me mention that these are static models, but, and I don't have time today, but they're closely related to dynamic models. For example, um, uh, uh, Berger and co-workers many years ago introduced something called the coupled swing equations. These are the coupled swing equations for the network of generators. There's a second order, inertia and damping, and then the right hand side is precisely the equilibrium equation that I've shown to you, and that's called the active, the, the equation on the top left, right? I just took uh, the sum of the AIJ and took it on the right hand side. So the equilibrium equation that I am trying to solve is in fact the, uh, the, the, the closely related to that, right? Also, the equilibrium equation is closely related to this model from dynamical systems and physics called the Kuramoto model of coupled oscillators. Kuramoto models are you know, widely studied and very relevant or, sh or shown to be relevant models in a number of phenomena, whether they're scientific, social scientific, or engineering phenomena. So here we're looking at static models, but they are applicable to a number of dynamic models as well. 
Now, here's what's, here's what's going to happen. So, as I told you, when I try to transmit more and more power, the angles are going to become larger and larger. In a first approximation, that's a linear behavior. Now, it's as if I had a spring. As I apply a force, the spring stretches. Except that now my spring is not linear ideal forever. At some point in time, the spring will, will, have, will undergo a bifurcation and there will be no more solution, right? So that's what I'm trying to formalize. Now, I don't have a one-dimensional spring. I have a network that I am playing with. So let's try to do the spring analogy for a network. How does that work? So this is the simplest I can think of. So I imagine I have one-dimensional objects moving on a line. Now, this node here is connected to two other nodes. What's the total amount of force that it perceives? Well, that amount of force is equal to the elastic coefficient times, and uh, this is the, the, the force at node j, sorry, at node i, that's where is xj minus xi, so proportional to the distance, right? So this is simply the sum, the resultant force applied on node i from the other nodes j that are connected to it. Now, it turns out that there is a matrix called the Laplace matrix that depicts, that captures exactly this relationship. Now, the Laplace matrix is very closely related to the adjacent symmetrix A that I've been playing along for the whole time. Uh, so, in fact, what it is is that it's minus A plus the sum of the rows of A. So here I, I wrote the, di sorry, the diagonal matrix whose diagonal entries are equal to the row sums of A. So here I wrote A times one N, so you get the row sums, and then you put that in the diagonal <coughs> matrix, right? Now, this Laplace matrix is known to have an eigenvalue equal to zero. And it's known, it's known to have all other eigenvalues with strictly positive real part, in, well, with positive or non-zero non real parts. Now, let me let lambda 2, if the graph is undirected, then the eigenvalues are real, fine. Now, let me let lambda 2 be the second smallest eigenvalue of L. So if the graph is undirected, L is symmetric, the eigenvalues are real, one we know is at zero, all of the others are positive or zero. So lambda 2 is the smallest. If the graph is connected, lambda 2 is strictly positive. Otherwise, lambda 2 is 0. But I'm going to assume my graph is connected, so lambda 2 is positive. Lambda 2 is referred to as the algebraic connectivity, and it's been popularized in the work by Fiedler, who studied all the beautiful properties of this eigenvalues of the Laplacian matrix, which, again, the Laplacian matrix is another object studied in algebraic graph theory, just like the adjacency matrix. Now, OK. I want to solve two simple spring network problems. These are really elementary, they're like undergraduate complexity. So suppose I apply some forces on my, on my matrix there, and let's suppose those forces are balanced, meaning to say the sum to zero, right? Otherwise, the entire system will go to the right. What's an, it will go to the right or to the left, will try, will accelerate uncontrollably. What's an equilibrium set of positions? Well, it turns out that you just have to compute the pseudo inverse of the Laplacian matrix Right multiply, left multiply uh, by uh, the load, the forces, and that's your value of the uh, equilibrium, the equilibrium position for the masses. Of course, you can also translate everything, fine, but that's the solution. So you just take pseudo inverse of L to compute the equilibrium position. So as a function of the forces, the displacement there's an L pseudo inverse. All right. Now, instead, if you ground your network, we need to say you connect. One of the, you, you, you fix the location of one of the objects. In this case, I, I, I fixed, I introduced one more object, the wall, and I connected it with one more spring. But now there still are only three move variables, right? Now, if you ground your network of springs, then imagine you apply no forces. If you apply no forces, there is an equilibrium position, right? Let's call that x rest. And the deviation from the equilibrium position is given to you by the inverse of L. Now, because this new Laplacian is going to be a, a, a variation of the one before, it's a Laplacian for the whole network where I remove row and column corresponding to the node that is now grounded, right? So if I take a Laplacian and I ground the node, then it's as you know, the, the grounded Laplacian, you remove row and column corresponding to the grounded node. All right, so now I can just take an inverse, right? And the force. So notice that the deviation from the rest is proportional to the force that I have applied and then modulated by the inverse. Right, of the Laplace. So keep in mind these two simple examples. This, I didn't prove this, but these are very straightforward. You just have to do the little now. now, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to find out if there are angles that can carry the amount of power that I would like to, to have, right? So the power is pi. Remember, some of the pi's are positive, the generators. Some of them are negative. In order for an equilibrium to exist, it is immediate to show 
that the total amount of positive power must be equal in magnitude to the total amount of negative power. So there has to be power balance at each instant of time. Otherwise, there simply is no solution. Now, what is happening here? Here, the analogy is that with the network of springs on a, on a ring. In other words, as I am increasing the amount of power, it's as if I was applying a negative torque on some nodes and a positive torque on the others, and there's a spring between them. If I apply small torques, I have a little power demand, that angle will start to open up. If I keep demanding the, the transmission of more and more power, finally I will reach the angle whereby the, the, the torque is actually decreasing and I find no more solution. How do I quantify this? So it's a question of the strength of the connectivity given by the network of springs and the power transmission. So it goes like this. So you should think of, this, of the torques as the active power and the displacements as the power angles. And then as you keep up applying more power or tra trying to transmit more power, you will find the angle pi over 2, at which point in time you will lose synchronization. You will lose the existence of the angles being capable of transmitting that amount of power. So these are the theorems that we were able to write, which talk about the fact that if you look at the pairwise differences in the power and you look at the two norm of it, so that's related to how much power you're trying to transmit, if that quantity is less than lambda over 2, which is a measure of the connectivity of the spring network, then in fact it is true that equilibrium angles do exist. And then that's true for all graphs. So that's, a, that's one of the sharpest conditions that I know of as of today for the existence of solutions of that set of equations. It is not sharp, meaning to say actually numerically you can find solutions when, 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 uh, even when that condition is violated. Now, we also have sharp conditions, but for graphs that have more structures. For example, if you're looking at a tree, if you're looking at graphs with short cycles, or if you're looking at the complete graph, then I have a different condition. And that says, look at the L pseudo inverse P. Remember, this L pseudo inverse is exactly what we had earlier in the case of this, this uh, spring network with the balanced torques, uh, balanced forces applied to it. And I, I need the infinity norm, so the maximum of the pairwise differences to be less than 1. That's a if and only if condition for the existence of solutions. So here, um, in summary here, I'm using this interpretation of spring connectivity to give sufficient conditions for the existence of an operating, uh, operating condition and for an understanding of how much power I can transmit. Now, in the case of reactive power, the model is slightly different, but there's a lot of similarity. It goes like this. So literally. As I, was, as I was saying earlier, at a load, I have a certain uh, reactive power demand. And the question is whether, so the generator will provide whatever reactive power is needed. I'm working under that assumption. The generator will set a really high voltage. And the question that you want to answer is, does there exist a high voltage solution at the load? So at the load, so here's the picture. The voltages at the, these are the blue nodes that are the generators. They are at high voltage and they do not move from there. At the loads, I apply reactive power, which is a way to think about I am pulling down the loads. The loads are being kept up by the, by the network through springs, described by the coefficients B, I, J. But if you pull them down too much, if you require too much reactive power at the loads, then in fact, you, the, the spring network will snap and there will be no more solution. So there's going to be voltage collapse and the voltage at the nodes will drop. So this is again on the vertical axis, there's voltage here. So when the spring network is very strong, everything is a high voltage. But when you pull down sufficiently, finally in the end, you will, you will have voltage collapse. Now, here I already explained this interpretation. These are the set of equations which look alike a set of a spring network. The bottom line is that here, for the case of the reactive power, we're able to complete the analysis in a more comprehensive way. That's a, that's a, that's a sufficient condition, but it's really not as bad as the one before. This is relatively close to being sharp. And, and it says that here, I have a grounded network, right? Because those nodes are a fixed voltage. So then it's no surprise that I get an inverse grounded Laplacian. There's a scaled version of it, not to worry about it. And that's Q load. This is the force that is being generated at the loads. And if that in magnitude is each of those entries of that vector in magnitude is less than one, then in a high voltage equilibrium solution will exist and you are guaranteed to avoid voltage collapse. All right? So this is the setup, and these are the two results. And they're clearly nonlinear, one for active, one for reactive, but they have this feature of using this, uh, this Laplacian matrices and this other intuition from network, linear network systems theory. So 
Um, I didn't talk about design results, but uh, let me just mention that, that there are some results, some design papers that we've wrote and others wrote or, uh, that exploit some of this uh, 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 graph theoretic and geometric understanding. Now, in the remaining, oh, here I have some references for you to be able to follow up. There's some really nice work by, some really early work by Tavora and Smith, which already identified the uh, powerful equation and, and brought nice, sufficient, and necessary conditions early on. There is a, well, the work by Kuramoto, of course, that uh, created lots of, lots and lots of work. Uh, and then there's an early paper by Arapostati, Shastri, and Varaya, uh, Wu, and Kamgai, and so on and so forth. So lots of interest in the powerful equations. Now, in the remaining 10 minutes, if, or five minutes, I will give you a glimpse of some recent work that we have conducted in the study of uh, uh, social networks. So the, the dominant trend here is that we are engineers, we have quantitative methods and tools and understanding, and there are people across the aisle working in the social sciences who have an understanding of phenomena and have a desire to quantify that understanding but don't, don't maybe have the tools and until yesterday didn't have the measurement methods to be able to do that. So, but nowadays, with the advance of uh, with the advance of the of online social networks, and with also with 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 just in general the availability of computing power, there's things that, that can be done. So now, um, let me uh, let me skip the setup here. Let me talk to you about what is the problem that I am interested in. So, uh, one of the dominant models for opinion formation is one is that same that I showed earlier for the fish swarming of average. So in other words, a group of individuals will discuss, will have a certain opinion at the initial time, and the final opinion to which they will agree with is a, is a consensus opinion under some conditions, and that consensus opinion is determined by the left dominant eigenvector, the centrality vector. Now, even if the matrix A uh, for us is a square matrix with all entries being identical, in the context of opinion dynamics and social networks, the entries of the matrix A have different interpretation and meaning. The diagonal entries of the matrix are the self-weights, are the, 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 the weights that an individual assigns to him or herself. Whereas the off-diagonal entries are weights that an individual willingly accords to others. Mathematically, it is easy to reparameterize the matrix A in the following way. I, have this, I take all of the diagonal entries and I call them diag x. Those are the self-weights. I think of them as variables. And then I reparameterize the off-diagonal entries, and I define a new matrix called W. That's also row stochastic, just like the matrix A, with a little bit of thinking. Now, the, the vector here that determines the final opinion is the left dominant eigenvector of the matrix A. But by W left, I denote the left dominant eigenvector of the matrix W. Now, in, uh, in applied psychology and, so in my, and groups, in applied psychology and group sociology, people have the following, have understood the following uh, uh, psychological process. It's called reflected appraisal. It's, uh, you know, it's really well established. It goes back to, uh, you know, 100 years. So it's not a, a brand new topic. It goes like this. Imagine you are in a, in a group that discusses a sequence of issues a long time. Now, as an individual, you dampen or elevate your self-weight depending upon what happened during the previous conversation. Uh, let me explain. When you elevate your self-weight, that means that you become more close to interpersonal influence because in setting up your new opinion, you're using an increasing percentage in your decision making of your previous opinion. So as you elevate your self-weight, you become more stubborn and less open to interpersonal influences. How does that happen? That happens like this. Your level of self-reliance, self self-weight, and stubbornness will increase if you had Influence centrality in the previous decisions. What's the influence centrality? That's the vector V left that I talked about already twice. Meaning to say, if you're part of a decision making process and you have a big impact on it, you perceive to have a big impact on it, what that means is that tomorrow when you go into the same group and you have another discussion, you tend to be more stubborn, more self reliant, and to let the opinion of others influence you less. Vice versa, if you keep going to meetings and every time you go and you speak your mind, nobody listens to you and your opinion has a very limited impact on the final outcome of that group's decision, then the day after tomorrow when you go to that meeting, you're going to be less stubborn and more open to interpersonal influence. So this phenomenon lends itself naturally to being written as a dynamical 
system, that is a feedback system that comes together by putting together all of these elements that I've talked about. So at the beginning of issue S, individuals have a certain level of self-reliance. Based on that and based on the interpersonal relationships, you can form an influence matrix. That influence matrix is what determines the outcome of that particular discussion. But beside the outcome of that discussion, I am interested in knowing who had power and centrality in that discussion. That's measured by the vector V left. Now, V left is the social power. How much power did an individual have in the social decision? In a simple approximation, V left is what determines the level of closeness, the level of self-weight of the individuals for the next issue. Does that make sense? So it's a feedback, it's a closed loop system. And it's a dynamic system, right? In fact, after some math, you can even write a formula for it, which is not all that important right now. The point is that, what is the problem that I am trying to solve? Well, as before, I would like to relate network structure to network function. Here, the function is the social power. Who has power in a group? Do you have a group that reaches, with time, reaches autocracy or reaches democracy? In a democratic group, everybody has one over n power. And in an autocratic group, one individual has a predominant share, share of the power. Now, as a function of the interpersonal relationship, interpersonal influences, do we go towards autocracy or do we go towards democracy? This model is capable of making such predictions. Now, the single mathematical result with which I will more or less conclude my presentation goes as follows. It turns out that under some mild assumption on the initial conditions and on the interpersonal network, <coughs> All solutions will converge to a unique fixed point. So all solutions converge to a unique fixed point. When I say this to my friends in sociology, the way I say that is I say the individuals will forget their initial values, their initial values of self-weight. Because you will converge to a value. It doesn't matter where you start from, right? At the end, you will have that particular self-weight, right? So it's a way of saying, even if you have a sequential meetings of groups of individuals, some of the individuals come, and at the beginning, they're very stubborn. In fact, this is a social, this reflected appraisal mechanism is a social mechanism that will tamp down that stubborn person and it will make that person more open to interpersonal interests, or vice versa. Perhaps you have a person that is very shy and doesn't speak up in public, but as an outcome of this process, in the end, may be very powerful in the group. So that's what this mathematics says. It says that you will converge to a unique fixed point. Now, interestingly, is what is that unique fixed point? How does it depend upon the parameter of the system? Well, the parameter of the system is just a matrix W of interpersonal accorded weights. So in other words, this is really a social phenomenon, meaning to say that my final self-weight will depend upon the network of interpersonal appraisals. It doesn't have to do with my initial value self-weight. It doesn't matter whether I'm stubborn or shy at birth. It depends upon the interpersonal social structure. At least that's what this model predicts. Now, this model predicts also that the that the vector of the uh, of equilibria is closely related to the left dominant eigenvector of the, of the matrix of interpersonal appraisals in two senses. First of all, it has the same ordering. And second of all, it displays a little bit of social power accumulation, meaning to say the individuals who have a lot of, who have a dominant amount of centrality in the matrix W end up getting an even larger amount of power X star, whereas the individuals who have low W lose some of the uh, centrality uh, uh, X star. I apologize, I think I went really fast here because I'm running out of time, but if any of you is interested in this topic, I'll be delighted to add more details. Here I have two simulations. If I have a matrix W, is W stochastic. This is the case of democracy. These are some simulations illustrating that. And if I have an, a network that has a star topology, then the center of the, the network, the center of the star topology, will, un will end up having 100% social power in this model. To cut a long story short here, what this work does is that we present a, a new perspective on influence networks and social power, a perspective that is grounded in dynamics and feedback and network systems. And that, uh, um, uh, in fact, I don't have time to talk about it today, but if you're interested, we do have some empirical validation. We conducted some experiments with human subjects and collected some data and verified some of the aspects and some of the behaviors predicted by this model. Now, there's some references in here. Um, let me uh, conclude. Let me conclude by saying, so let's take a step back. I've talked about three things. I've shown to you a number of examples 
uh, you know, coming from biology, coming from uh, compartmental flows, coming from engineering, uh, uh, epidemics, and so on and so forth. Now, many of these systems, so the, the main point of my talk was that there's a beautiful theory, beautiful and powerful, uh, that allows you to really study uh, uh, the dynamical properties of these systems by, by using standard matrix uh, theory tools. Um, and then um, I believe uh, also in the two contexts, the two example systems of power and, so, and, and social, power network and social influence, the problems I looked at are pretty fundamental and, and it's interesting to bring together the general theory with these application areas. And then finally, I do believe that um, as a control community, we do have the tools to, um, to be able to reach out and talk to these communities uh, of uh, you know, social scientists or uh, you know, um, ecologists or whatever it is that have interest in these application domains. And I think that we can uh, bring to bear tools that are relevant and help. Thank you for your attention. Um, myself, I have not. However, it's a great question. There's lots of interest. Uh, the, first off, there's a beautiful book by Matthew Jackson, an economist at Stanford, entitled Social and Economic Networks, in which uh, many, many interesting phenomena are modeled. Um, there is um, a group at MIT, Tarana uh, um, Chimoglu, has been writing a number of papers, and um, um, Reza uh, Tadesalahi at uh, Columbia. Uh, lots of interesting models from economics. Um, and, uh, well, and, and finances. Um, uh, as I, I think I had a picture of a book uh, um, uh, by um, uh, my, my mind is blank right now. Uh, Nobel Award winning work on input output uh, uh, system. So, yeah, I, I have a generic answer for you. I, I haven't myself worked on it, but I believe there's plenty of interest in understanding um, uh, yeah, how shock propagates, the effect of noise, competition, and so forth. That's a great point. Uh, uh, so suppose I have data. Have you looked at the possibility of reconstructing the networks from data? Um, myself, I have not. I apologize. Uh, lots of interest in there as well. There's a very rich domain. There's methods coming from mobility theory, methods from learning, methods from uh, uh, yeah, from structure systems theory. So yeah, I have not done that today. Um, um, but it is something that is absolutely. Yeah, so in, in um, some of the under let me just uh, take your question and, and, and expand on it. Um, uh, there's lots of interest in smart grids. There's lots of interest in integration of the uh, world. Um, many of the papers I've read start very much, pretty much start exactly with the introduction of the parkour business and then the design of control suits to guarantee the existence of uh, primary, secondary, tertiary uh, objectives. So you want to stabilize the frequency, you want to have a fair allocation uh, of the power demand uh, to the various generators. Okay? And then finally, you also want to solve some economic optimization from the tertiary objectives. So there's very rich literature. Um, uh, <coughs> people have looked at problems in terms of the coupled equations, like I showed today, just active and, and reactive. But then, of course, uh, people are also saying, removing or making the models realistic. So we have some work in Automatica and in transactional industrial electronics where we use um, some um, uh, yeah, one of the control strategies that have turned out to be useful is to use a, a good old integral control, uh, but with the new slant of adding averaging on top of it. So we have uh, some papers on some control distributed averaging uh, pro proportional integral control. One last question I have Okay. I don't know if I can formulate it nicely, but uh, so uh, talking of the social control, opinion building, and yep. so recently that all this, you know, pollsters they get their polls wrong. Yeah. Britain, including India, US, and there are people who try to also build opinion via social platforms, TVs, and all. Yeah. So, what would be the uh, impact of your work? How do how would you explain that phenomena, or or? The statisticians will, statisticians will do a better job than this. 
Um, I think it's going to be an interesting case study for years and years and years as to what went wrong in the polls related to the at least the U.S. elections. Um, um, it's been incredibly surprising, uh, or well, I should Britain, say, sorry, Britain. Britain, Britain was was supposed to be. Well, yeah, you're right. You're right as well. Certainly. Um, um, I don't know that the. Um, so one of the slides I skipped because of the, in the interest of time, uh, was describing the scope of the model. And so the scope of the model that I've, that I've described today was really centered on, um, um, on, on groups that, that are organized in a certain way uh, and that are uh, deliberative groups in which a certain group of individuals repeatedly meet. Uh, I, think, um, um, I think my models uh, are far from describing a reality in which um, Individual society are are subject or have access to completely different sources of information and, and form opinions in a very isolated way. So um, um, I think my answer is that there's a gap here for sure. When a uh, politically incorrect question, you talk of democracy and autocracy. So uh, my apologies, but just on a lighter note. Yeah. Uh, could we tell the American administration which country is ready for democracy? No. Uh, the American administration has been uh, wavering between uh, wanting to promote democracy or uh, so wanting to promote American uh, economic business. Anyway, okay. uh, I, will, uh, just on a lighter note. I will thank you again for your attention and not belabor the politics here. Okay, let's have this speaker.